Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I know it has been a minute since I have sat down like this and filmed a video. In January, I released one big project for the month on the case of Christian Andriacchio. I know a lot of you probably didn't see it because it was demonetized and YouTube doesn't do a really good job of pushing out content that's demonetized. It is a two and a half hour documentary that I worked on for a really long time and it was a really just rewarding experience. At this point, I was going to remind you guys to sign the petition. However, we hit gold today, which is uh, February 10th. I'm so, so proud of everyone who signed the petition and shared the petition. The Andracchio family is extremely grateful and I will keep you guys up to date on that White House response. But today I'm going to be telling you about the case of Jody Husentrude, which has become pretty much a cold case at this point, but they are really trying to ramp up awareness about this case and there isn't really much content about it on YouTube. And I am so excited to announce to you guys that the last Thorn campaign that we did, if you did not see it, it was on my Carly Gousset video. We did something totally different and I linked up with a very small Australian company, literally a couple people on the team. And they have been kind enough to not only offer you guys 10% off their entire website, but also donate 20% of every purchase to Thorn. And I'm super excited to say that this was the most successful way that I've been able to raise money for Thorn to date. We have raised over $11,000 for Thorn with one campaign through Magic of Eye. We also raised an additional $2,300 on our merch website, bringing us to over $13,000 for one Thorn campaign. Can we just take Take a minute and I just want to thank you guys. I would not be able to have raised almost $70,000 for Thorn without all of you. If you are not familiar with Thorn, I will link their website below so you can check it out, but they are fighting against child exploitation and child human trafficking online. They have saved over 10,000 children to date. The offer is still on the table. If you miss me talking about these, these are very unique, really cool planners. Um, they are astrology themed planners, so they go you know, along with the stars. This is how I use mine. I love my planner. Beautiful. It's vegan leather. It has this rainbow shimmer effect. And if you kind of feel like you're too late to get a planner, I know it's already February. They don't only just have planners. They also have journals. They come in multiple colors. I just wanted to remind you guys that the code THORN works on the Magic of Eye website site-wide. Like you can use it on their moon phase calendars or anything else they have, planners, stickers. But without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into the Jody Who's Intrude case. So this is an older case. Um, Jody went missing in the 90s. So this case takes place in Minnesota. Jody Who's Intrude was born on June 5th. 1968 and raised in Long Prairie, Minnesota. And growing up, she was really active and popular. She had a pretty normal upbringing. In high school, she really liked golf. She was actually on the golf team and won the state class A tournament in both 1985 and 1986. And like I said, Jody was really popular. She had a lot of friends and built a lot of strong relationships over the years. Friends that are still looking for her and fighting for her to this day. And they said that Jody was a big dreamer and her biggest dream was that she wanted to be famous. After she graduated high school, she went to St. Cloud State University where she studied mass communications and speech communication. And during her time in college, she actually joined the school's TV news network and had a really big role in that and really, really enjoyed it. Metro area is among the top 20 areas in the nation in total population. So I'm not clowning around and I say our show has to come to a close. She was good at it. People on campus enjoyed watching her and it really confirmed her love for journalism, for being on the news and she knew that she wanted to eventually have her spot on possibly even a national news television network. Jody actually graduated from St. Cloud in 1990 and then she actually began working for an airline, but pretty quickly she got back into journalism and she started her broadcasting career with KGAN in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Jody who's in truth, Channel 2 News, Cedar Rapids. Okay, had to do a quick voiceover here because my camera, it's a newer camera that I'm just getting used to, kind of malfunctioned in between clips. 
and I lost a couple sentences there. So after working in Cedar Rapids, Jody ended up returning to Minnesota for a job at KSAX in Alexandria. But shortly after that, she returned to Iowa for another position at KIMT in Mason City, Iowa. And Jody actually landed an anchor job for the morning and afternoon shows. So she was very happy and producers were really excited about having her. They were a bit nervous that her Minnesota accent was a little bit too strong at first. President Clinton Clinton leaves this morning for the Group of Seven Summit in Nova Scotia. Way to go, Kevin. I'm getting there slowly. Wait, way to keep me in check. They talked about like trying to give her speech therapy and try to get rid of the accent, especially, you know, if she wanted to go on to national news one day. But people in Minnesota really liked hearing the accent. People described her as like, a morning cup of joe, a sunshine that everyone needed to start their day. She was on the 6 a.m. newscast, so a lot of people literally started their day out with Jody. So it was June 27th, 1995. Like I said, she was on the 6 a.m. newscast, so she had to be at work pretty early. You know, they have to run over a few things when they get there, plus do hair and makeup. So Jody normally arrived to the station around 3.30 a.m. Now her producer at KIMT was named Amy Kunz and she would call Jody if she ever was there, you know, after four. Like if she wasn't there yet, she would call and sometimes there would be mornings where Jody had slept in or her alarm didn't go off for whatever reason. So she would make sure that she got there with enough time to get on by 6 a.m. So Amy started calling her. She actually did answer the phone and she said that she was running late for work because she had overslept, but that she would be right there. She was asking about the show. She was concerned about the show and she said, I'll be right there. So they waited for her, however, by the time 5.30 rolled around, Jody still was not at the station and she was supposed to be on in 30 minutes. Amy called her apartment again, her landline, and there was no answer. By 6 a.m. she had still not arrived, so Amy actually had to step in for her and do her role on her show called Daybreak. She calls it her show, you know, she wouldn't miss it for anything. And then an hour later at 7 a.m. there was still no sign of Jody. So the news station of course calls the police and lets them know that she did not show up for work that day. So police went straight to Jody's apartment and when they got there they found her red Mazda Miata left out in the parking lot and the scene that was left around her car definitely pointed to some type of foul play. Her personal items were scattered all over the ground around her car, including a bent key, her car key, her shoes, and her hair dryer. She was probably running late, brought her hair dryer to work with her. Not only that, but there were drag marks near her car, indicating that Jody was possibly dragged away from the scene. Maybe she had put the key into the ignition and someone had grabbed her and somehow the key bent, or maybe she used the key as a weapon, but something happened at that spot near her car. I mean, clearly this is a woman that was just headed out to work. Clearly a very active young woman, as everyone has told us. Police also found someone's palm print on the car. That same day, police also brought search dogs to her apartment as well as the Winnebago River. This was very close to where Jody lived and they searched the entire area, but they did not find any good clues. So that night, the KIMT news team had to break the news to their viewers that one of their own news anchors was missing. Police are investigating the disappearance, but aren't saying much else at this time. Jody Hoosentrout was and still is a very dear friend of mine, as well as all of us here at KIMT, and we're inviting all of you to join us in keeping her and her family in your prayers this evening. I don't know what it looked like to the viewer, but I just know inside it was a mess. I feel like that would be incredibly hard to have to talk about someone that you know personally and report on them as if it's news. It's just such an awkward and terrible situation. The police did a full search of the newsroom. They could not find anything that was useful to them in this case. Jody's family and friends were just devastated along with the entire community. Fear is growing in one Iowa farm town. Someone is missing, not a face in the crowd, but one of the most familiar faces in town. 
And a lot of people, including Jodi's family and friends, were very worried that someone took advantage of Jodi because she was so nice and friendly. She's one of those people who will talk to anyone, never met a stranger. She would strike up a conversation with someone at a grocery store and be there an extra hour. She was that type of person that would take time out of her day to talk to you, get to know you. She was interested in people. She was a very nice person and very trusting, possibly someone who would be taken advantage of. People also were worried that maybe she had some type of stalker. Eventually it was discovered that a few months prior to Jodi's disappearance, she actually made a report that she had been being stalked. Back in October of 1994, Jodi was out hiking on this trail and there was this creepy black truck that kept driving really close behind her and she reported it to the police. But despite her making the report, police were never able to figure out who it was. So police started trying to figure out exactly what was going on in Jodi's life before she disappeared. As they were investigating, a neighbor actually called in and reported that they heard a scream the morning that Jodi went missing. Of course, they didn't call the police though, so nothing could have been done. So it definitely shows you, you know, if you hear something, say something. If you're wrong, that's okay, but you should always call if you can. In addition to this, they also realized that there were a few reports of a creepy white van in her apartment complex that morning. But it seemed like as far as evidence, that was really it. Police were struggling to paint a picture of Jody's life. So there are some suspects to go over here and some very possible scenarios. First, there's this guy named John Van Sice. It's very odd, but Jody had this strange relationship with this man. He was a lot older than her, 22 years older than her, but they didn't have a romantic relationship. They had a friendship at least in Jody's mind. He claimed that he viewed Jody as a daughter and that's what Jody would say if anyone ever questioned it, that he was like a father to her in a way. She was like a daughter to me. She was just like my own child. Uh, I treat her like my own child. He was a friend. Jody would go water skiing on his boat a lot. She sort of brought him into her friend group. He was kind of around a lot. Now, originally he met Jody in a bar, but it just so happened that they live in the exact same apartment complex. Now, to me, that's curious because I wonder if he actually knew that about her before he even met her at the bar. A lot of times with stalkers, they'll set up situations for people that live near them or they'll even move into apartment complexes to specifically stalk somebody. So police eventually figured out that the day before Jody went missing, she played in a golf tournament. And after this golf tournament, she actually went back to John's house because he was in the tournament as well. According to John, they were just hanging out. They had spent the night looking at a video from a surprise party that he had thrown for her like a couple weeks before this and they were watching the footage and laughing. She was laughing the whole time she was there and she laughed all the time she laughed. We watched the tape and we chuckled and we laughed, we giggled, we, we, we hee hawed, we did everything and said we're going to cut this portion out of the tape, we're going to cut this portion out of the tape. Honestly, she's alive somewhere. I just hope she's not hurt. I hope she's okay. I hope she can come back soon. She wouldn't want to sit around home and cry and, and sob she'd want to be out having fun because that was her it's her it is everything is, it is her. Eventually police realized that Jody had become friends with John at a time in his life where he was kind of in a rough place and they felt like maybe Jody just really had sympathy for him, felt bad for him. He was going through a divorce. His life was kind of just a mess. Not only that, he was court ordered to have a breathalyzer test in his car and no surprise he had been arrested for drunk driving in the past. I guess he didn't really have a lot of friends at the time and like I said, Jody kind of brought him into her friend group and he just started hanging around them. Her friends thought it was like kind of weird, but they accepted it because she accepted it and she would always play it down and be like, he's just like this guy, he's like my friend, it's just a friend thing. But they all thought, you know, it seems like he wants more from her. It seems like he is interested in becoming more than friends or wants more than Jody is willing to give. It maybe seems that they are not on the same page. At one point, he even named his boat after Jody, her friends thought that was really weird and told her, you know, hey, like, mm, that's a kind of a red flag of a possible obsession or a stalker. But she played it off, thought it was kind of sweet, you know, just thought he was harmless, really. So some people thought that maybe they came to a point where John told Jody that he wanted more from her than just to be friends and that she said no and it triggered some type of altercation, which led to her death. 
or maybe he was mad about it and then assaulted her later. So one of John's friends that was actually also friends with Jody and went to work with John every day was actually with him that morning. She claims that she called John around 6 a.m. to confirm that they were going to work together like normal. And she said that John seemed totally fine and was acting the same as he always did. She basically said that there's just no possible way that between the hours of 4 and 6 a.m. that he abducted her and got rid of her body and was fine by the time she picked him up for work. In 1995, John Van Sice actually passed a polygraph test, so there's that, you know, polygraphs aren't super reliable, but take it for what you will. In November of 1995, Jody's family was feeling so desperate for answers that they actually traveled to California and met with three different psychics to try to help, and none of them ended up helping in any way. By May 4th of 1996, there still was nothing solid that had been found. And about 100 volunteers went out and searched an area of Cerro Gordo County and left little flags to mark everything that appeared to be suspicious. We hope to find any type of evidence. Oh, yuck. Any type of clues, you know, earrings, um, purse, anything that we can find. Each of these sites was then re-examined by law enforcement, but no promising evidence was ever found. But then two years later, there was another person of interest that came up. On January 26, 1998, an investigative reporter at WCCO-TV in Minneapolis named Caroline Lowe was reporting on a crime spree that was happening in the area. She covered a man named Tony Jackson who was accused of sexually assaulting four women in 18 days. And she thought that maybe it was possible that he had something to do with Jody's disappearance. Tony actually had a history of stalking all his victims before he assaulted them. And it was discovered that he was actually living in Iowa within two blocks of Jody's TV station during the time that she went missing. Tony was actually a star college basketball player, but he had a tendency to randomly snap and would become violent. He eventually got kicked out of college and enrolled in North Iowa Community College in Mason City. And during this time, he started becoming interested in broadcasting. And he was spending a lot of time watching the news and analyzing reporters. A lot of people believe that it's possible that he had seen Jody on the news. Is there a chance that he could have stalked her and you know, memorized her schedule. It would have been easy for anyone to figure out Jody's schedule because it was so regular. People knew where she was. She was live from a certain spot every single day. You could easily figure out what time she came in. In addition to all the suspicion, it was discovered that five days before Jody went missing, Tony and his girlfriend went through a really bad breakup and he became very angry and violent. Not only that, but his girlfriend and Jody looked a lot alike. Tony and his girlfriend did eventually try to get back together, but at some point he ended up choking her and he was arrested on domestic violence. Although his girlfriend decided to not proceed with the charges and he was let go. Four months after he was arrested, he actually left Iowa and went to Minnesota. And that is where he committed four assaults. He was arrested again in 1997. Police had pulled him over and found a bunch of creepy stuff in his car, such as rope and duct tape. And all the signs just pointed to him being a predator. Eventually they figured out what he had done and he was sentenced to life in prison. Apparently while he was in prison, he told another inmate that he had abducted a news anchor and killed her. The inmate actually said that Tony wrote a rap about the woman being buried in a farm near a silo in a town called Tiffin. And Tiffin is only a few hours away from Mason City. So law enforcement decided to go to that town. And there ended up being that silo that he had talked about. So dogs were brought into the search area and the dogs alerted that there was something on these wooden boards. So they were sent to a crime lab, but unfortunately it actually came out to be nothing. On May 5th, 1995, the Mason City Police actually released a statement that they had conducted a full investigation on Tony Jackson and that he was not considered a suspect in the Jody Who's Intrude case. Jody's family still believes that there's a chance he could have had something to do with it and it is totally possible. But anytime he has been approached by any interviews or given any statements, he always says that he had nothing to do with Jody Who's in Truth. So years went by without any other good leads or any real movement in the case. On May 14th, 2001, six years after Jody first went missing, the family made a very difficult decision to legally pronounce her dead. And that was done so that they could settle her estate. And it's a thing that a lot of families have to do. I don't think it means that they fully believe that they're dead, but oftentimes it's to do something legally or something to do with money. And it's sad when they have to do that because sometimes they're worried that it 
will lessen the urgency behind people finding them and looking for them and just interest in the case. And you know, 20 plus years later, we still have no idea what happened to Jody. But her friends and family are not giving up. They've actually really reignited interest in her case. It was recently on 48 Hours over the summer and they've now created a movement called Find Jody. They're really trying to make her be known as Jody, not even just Jody who's in truth, probably because that's such a hard last name, but also just because Jody's so simple and she's just known as Jody in the community. You know, everyone knows who Jody is around there. There has been one other weird thing that happened, but I'm not sure if this is considered really a lead or anything. But in June of 2008, some copies of Jody's journal, 84 pages of it actually, were mailed to a local news station and no one knows why or who it's from. There was no return address and it was postmarked Waterloo, Iowa. Her actual journal is in possession of law enforcement and has been since the beginning. So a lot of people are like, how did someone end up getting that? Like, is there someone in the police station who's leaked something? Or is someone there possibly guilty? There was a lot of poor police work actually. The biggest thing that they did wrong, and I honestly can't even believe this, is at the crime scene, they never sectioned it off or taped it off to keep other people from stepping on the crime scene or possibly taking evidence out or adding something to the scene. It was just open and so much evidence could have been tampered with. That was a huge mistake. In addition to this, police only held on to Jody's car for a few months and they eventually just released it back to the family. If the car is pretty much the crime scene, why would you give it back to the family so early? A lot of people believe if they had held on to the car, maybe they would have come up with something else by now, especially because there's more modern technology now and better ways of processing evidence. So they should have just held on to the car. In March of 2017, it was announced that John Van Sice is actually still on police radar. They actually served a search warrant for GPS info on two of his cars and they have kept the findings of this secret. They say that they cannot update people on the case because they don't want to compromise the investigation. So there could be more to come. It's possible that this case still could be solved. So if you know anything, they are still looking for information. I will have all of that in the description box in case you do have something that could be helpful in this case. But that's really all there is as of now. You know, I know missing people can become like stories to a lot of us, but these are real, people who were loved, who had families, who had whole lives and they were just uprooted out of their life, you know? It's just terribly sad. She's gone every birthday, every holiday. I mean, her family has never gotten over the pain of losing her. There's a possibility that someone just has the answers to at least help them figure out what happened and give the family that closure that they need. But that's it for me today, guys. I hope you are having a good day and don't forget to check out our Magic of Eye collaboration for Thorn. Just use the code THORN for 10% off Magic of the Eye and 20% will go to Thorn. Also, you can check out my website, milehire.com to get the Thorn merch that is always available on there. But I will see you guys in my next video. Bye. Where'd you go? Seems like it's been forever. Where'd you go?